so yes, I'm South African. I studied medicine uh, around the corner at UCT uh, and left shortly thereafter, went off to London, practiced for a while, got into web development somehow, um, and became a Perl programmer for my sins. Uh, and I, we were running a website that uh, put obituaries online, and it was a bit like Facebook for the dead. Um, <laughs> And we, we needed search, and at the time we were using MySQL, wasn't coping very nicely, and I, I looked at what was out there, and there was this brand new product. The first release had been made, uh, it was version 04, uh, called Elasticsearch. And I went to the website, and it looked awesome, it, it, it looked a bit unbelievable, to be honest. It, it just promised too much, uh, but it delivered. And uh, so I ended up becoming the first user of Elasticsearch, and uh, when we sold my last company, I uh, joined the newly formed Elasticsearch. Um, I'm busy working on Elasticsearch, the definitive guide with O'Reilly, uh, with my colleague Zach Tong, and this is available online for free on the Elasticsearch website, should you be looking for a place to start at that URL. So I'm guessing most of you have heard about Elasticsearch, yes? How many people are using it? Wow, okay, that, that's impressive. Because when I was coming over, I said, do you want me to do a training while I'm here? And they went, well, we get no hits from South Africa. There's, there's probably no interest. So it looks like we need to change our opinion on that. For those of you who don't know, Elasticsearch is a real-time distributed search and analytics engine. Okay, so to just break this down a bit, it does full text search which is a hard job for tra traditional databases to do, but it also does structured search and so on. It can calculate analytics, essentially kind of group buys, um, but in the context of, well, you, real um, tip, don't let your three-year-old nephew play with your, laser, your own laser pointer just before a presentation. <laughs> the, it can, bloody hell, it can calculate analytics in the context of the user's search results, okay? So, you know, you go to booking.com and you type in uh, Hotel London and it tells you there are six five-star hotels and 14 four-star hotels and so on. Those are all calculated on the fly based upon your search results. And, and that's the kind of thing it can do very easily. It's real time, which means that as your data flows in, so you can query the results. It's not like uh, MapReduce where you, you get, collect all the results together and run the job for two weeks and then you get an answer. This is produced in real time and it's got to handle masses and masses of data, petabytes of data, uh, and so it is distributed out of the box. Most of the talks about Elasticsearch are about how to use it. And somebody today said, oh, you, are you gonna have a, a cool demo? I said, no. Um, you can find lots of those talks out there, but what there's not much about is how does it actually work? The, it, it has a series of kind of moving parts that all have to work together to produce this real-time distributed search and analytics engine. And what I want to do today is to show the problems that we face in producing something like this and how they are solved in Elasticsearch. So the first thing is making text searchable. Here we've got a, a sonnet from Shakespeare, and I'm sure most of us have written something like this at some stage, all right? That, that's fine when you, you've got four users, but really it's slow and inflexible. So we need another way of making search uh, searchable, I mean text searchable. And the approach we take is to divide up uh, the text into separate words or terms. And then we, we collect these terms from all of the documents in our collection and we build a sorted list of unique terms. And then we, we list which documents those terms appear in. So now to perform, uh, we end up with something like this. To perform the same query we're looking for darling buds, we can just look up buds and darling and find out which documents they appear in and there we've got our answer. Okay, so this structure is called an inverted index. And besides telling you what documents it appears in, it stores a whole bunch of other metadata. It gives you frequencies. So the word the appears very frequently. The word supercatafragilistic expialidocious appears very uncommonly. And so that is going to be in a much more important word than the word the. 
So that helps us with relevance calculations. Uh, the length of text, a title field, is a much a shorter field than a long body field. So if words appear in the title field, chances are it's going to be more relevant than words that only appear in the body field. So it helps us to, to weigh up our, our documents. With term positions, we can use them for word proximity queries and phrase matches. And with the character offsets of the word in the original string, we can produce highlighted search snippets. Now, uh, this is a complicated subject, and we could do a whole talk just on this. So I, I'm not going to go into it, just to say that with the metadata that is stored in the inverted index, we can do some very complicated and interesting queries. OK, so we've got our inverted index. It's not just for text. It works just as well for numbers, dates, booleans, enums, geopoints and geoshapes. So the same approach that we use to make text searchable, we can use on structured data like prices or dates or locations. The next step is analytics. And while for search we've got that inverted index which maps the values to the document IDs in which they appear, for analytics we need to look at the search results and go from the document ID to the value that it contains. And in order to do that, we need to uninvert the inverted index. All right, so we basically read the inverted index and turn it around. That can be quite a slow process. So we cache these values in memory for fast access. And in Elasticsearch, we refer to that as field data. But what that means is that when you need to calculate analytics, it's coming out of your RAM. So it's really, really fast. It gives you on-the-fly analytics in the context of a user's query. So the next user comes along, change, uh, searches on a different set of, of keywords, and the, the uh, analytics that we show to them are exactly right for their keywords. These are not pre-cached and stored and estimates. So we get relevant analytics for each user. And the kind of metrics we can calculate are, you know, the count, min, max, sum, average, percentiles, cardinality, how uh, unique things are, standard dev, variance, etc. And so these will be calculated on some numeric field or, uh, yeah, a numeric field or a date field, anything that, that can be represented as a number. But then we can group these values by things like popular terms or significant terms, which are the uncommonly common terms, uh, ranges, dates, geolocations, geodistances, et cetera. And groups can contain subgroups, which can contain subgroups, and so on. So uh, analytics is a very powerful tool in Elasticsearch. And in fact, a lot of people don't use it for search at all. They just use it for analytics. So to build this inverted index, we collect all of the documents in our corpus, we process them, and then we write this inverted index to disk. And that inverted index is immutable, which, and the immutability gives it some very important properties. It's cache friendly, so that once you've read it from disk, basically you're going to be reading from RAM from then on. Uh, the field data associated with the inverted index never changes, so once you've uninverted the index, you don't need to do it again. It just stays there in memory. And, uh, because you're collecting a, a whole lot of data together, you can compress it easily, it, it uses less space on disk, it uses less space in the file system cache, and there's no locking when you're writing this data. The problem is, it's immutable. You can't change anything. So the next step we have to deal with is how to turn this inverted index into a dynamic inverted index, something we can update. And the way this happens in Lucene, Lucene is a set of Java libraries which are used to build search engines. Uh, Sona is based on Lucene, Elasticsearch is based on Lucene. We use Lucene internally. It is some very smart code indeed. And uh, what we're talking about here is all in Lucene. Later on, we, we add stuff from Elasticsearch. So in Lucene, you start out with this in-memory buffer. And gradually, you index documents. They get added to the buffer. Um, and then we commit, and that commit writes a segment to disk, and it writes a commit point. And from then, that segment is now searchable. So we were talking about an inverted index before, and now we're talking about a segment. A segment is an inverted index. It's a standalone inverted index by itself. 
Then we continue adding documents, we commit again, uh, write a new segment and a new commit point, and suddenly we can search across both of these segments sequentially. All right, so we'll search that one, then search this one, collect the results together, and that gives you the, the result uh, of your query. And so we carry on. More documents, another commit point, another segment, and that uh, is searchable. So a leucine commit writes a new segment, writes a new commit point, f-syncs it to disk, and clears the in-memory buffer. Then it reopens the index, which contains all of these segments, to make them all searchable. Okay, the problem is f-sync is really expensive. So you can't do this frequently, all right? And what we want is near real-time search. So here, uh, we start to go off again with the in-memory buffer, index and documents, and now instead of committing, we do something called a leucine flush, which writes a segment to disk. And it is searchable. You notice know there's no commit point and the segment hasn't been f-synced yet. We carry on indexing more documents, flush, uh, searchable, more documents, flush, uh, searchable, and then at some stage, we do a commit. And this is the heavy thing. This is the thing that f syncs to disk, and now all of, our, all of this data that we've written is safely stored on disk, uh, and we carry on going. So a flush writes a new segment, clears the in-memory buffer, and reopens the index to make things searchable. There's no f sync, which means that it's lightweight. We can do this thing often. Unfortunately, your data is not safe until the f-sync has happened. So even if you uh, just turn off the, the uh, server, you're going to lose data. So step six is don't lose data. And Elasticsearch added a transaction log uh, to this process. Now we have an in-memory buffer and a transaction log. We index documents, it gets added to both. Flush, write a new segment, searchable, more documents, another flush, searchable, and at some point, we issue a commit, we write a commit point, f-sync it, and clear the transaction log. We no, no longer need the data here because our data has been safely written to disk there. So in Elasticsearch, we refer to a refresh, uh, and that is a leucine flush, essentially. It makes the changes searchable, and it's a lightweight operation. A leucine, uh, an Elasticsearch flush, on the other hand, is a leucine commit, which clears the transaction log, persists changes, and is heavy. A refresh happens every second by default. So while you're indexing documents, those uh, changes appear in your search results within a second of being made, which gives us near real-time search and near real-time analytics. But if you are flushing every second, things soon start to get out of control. So, with too many segments, remember you've got to search each segment sequentially. You end up with slow searches. Each segment is small, so you've got a poor distribution of term frequencies, which means poor relevance calculations and poor compression. Step seven is to reduce the number of segments that we've got. We start off and we write the small segments to disk and they're all searchable. And then at some point in the background, this merge process kicks in. And it starts reading from uh, the existing segments and writing to a new, bigger segment. And, you know, we can carry on indexing while this is happening. It's in the background. It doesn't stop us from doing anything. At a certain point, it's going to finish copying it over. It now switches to searching in these two uh, segments, and those other smaller segments get deleted. All right? And so it carries on, a new segment, and this, these two segments at some stage will become an even bigger segment, and so it goes on. So now we've got a, a process that can control itself. It's giving us near real-time search. Our data is safe, and it, uh, it, things don't run out of, we, we don't run out of file handles because of too many segments. We, we've got good term distributions, and so on. Many small segments are merged into one big segment. Any deleted documents, uh, remember we said that a segment is immutable. So deletes don't happen immediately. They just, documents get marked as deleted. And during this merge process, 
the deleted documents get uh, garbage collected and, and uh, removed. We throttle the process to make sure that the I.O. from copying loads of data doesn't kill the rest of your, uh, your search and indexing functionality. So that's great. But at a certain stage, you need another truck. And so we need to scale out, not up. The, the, at a certain point, you can't buy a bigger server. They just don't exist, all right? So we need to be able to string multiple servers together. And the way to do that is to shard your data. And sharding your data usually means rewriting your application. Uh, and it's not a pleasant experience. But fortunately, in Elasticsearch, it's transparent, all right? Just some terminology. We've got multiple segments, which uh, together we refer to as one shard and multiple shards together are referred to as one index all right a node is a running instance of Elasticsearch you can actually run multiple instances on one machine but typically when we talk about a node we're talking about one server on, on one node so think of it just as a server a shard is a bucket of data it's the physical worker unit that actually sits on the disk and it lives on a single node all right while an index is a logical namespace that points to one or more shards so your application talks to an index but internally the the the, the actions get sent to an individual shard or, or to many shards depending on whether you, what you're doing it needs a formula to map a document to a shard and it's a very simple formula. We hash the ID of the document and divide it by the number of shards and take the remainder. And that's the shard that our document will live on. So if we index document ID one, plug that into the formula, we end up with shard two. Index document ID, uh, get document ID two, do exactly the same thing, it ends up at shard zero. But then when we search, we don't worry about that because actually the search goes out to all of the shards that we know about. It runs locally on each shard. The top results are returned from all these shards, reduced into an overall result set, which gets returned to the client. So we don't have to worry about this formula there. Okay, sharding taken care of. Um, but of course, you don't know how many nodes you want to run. You, perhaps you're starting off small now, but later on, you, you've got grand ambitions. You're going to get to uh, a thousand nodes. You don't want to pay for that upfront. Shards allow you to start small. So we can over allocate. We can put more uh, shards on a single box than we actually need. Later on, when we add more nodes, those shards will just automatically migrate in order to balance out the cluster and to take advantage of the extra hardware that's available to them. And we can create multiple indices, um, which will just be distributed across the nodes that we have at the time. But of course, if you've got more hardware, chances are you're going to have more hardware failure. So at 3 o'clock on, on Sunday morning, uh, somebody trips over a cable, and you've lost a third of your data. Okay, so the next step is to add redundancy, which means for every shard, make a copy. Up until now, we've been talking about a shard, but now, uh, from now we, we'll talk about that original shard as the primary shard, it's the main shard. And the copies are called replica shards. Uh, you can have no replicas or you can have one, two, however many replicas you want. So we start off with a single node, and we've just got primaries 0, 1, and 2. We add another node, and it copies them across. So uh, now we've got replicas 0, 1, and 2. At this stage, we have a redundant system. We can lose either box, and all of our data will be intact. When we add a new node, it just shifts them around to make use of the new hardware, and our system is rebalanced. It, you notice that. Uh, here we've got two primaries, there one, there none. It doesn't matter. A shard's a shard's a shard. A primary is just a role. So now if we lose a node, we've still got copies of all of our data. But what we don't have is primary zero. So the first thing it does is promote the replica uh, to a primary, and then it starts reallocating the replicas. And by the time this is finished, 
uh, we will be back to a rebalanced cluster with full redundancy. A primary shard is just a role. When you index a document or delete a document, it receives the changes first, and it, it tries to execute those changes uh, on the primary shard first. Once that has happened successfully, that change gets sent off to any replica shards that we have in parallel. Uh, and once the replica shards have said, yep, finished with this, it returns to the client uh, a success message. The number of primaries primary shards that you can have in an index is fixed when you create the index. And th this seems like a, it would be a problem for knowing how to scale later, but actually Elasticsearch comes with a lot of flexibility uh, that we're not going to go into today, but um, the ability to create multiple indices, to query multiple indices, uh, alias filter, it, index aliases become very useful, but like I say, it's a topic for another day. Replica shards are just copies. They can be used to serve uh, read and search requests. Uh, and you can change the number of replicas on a live index. You can, for instance, build the index with no replicas and then add replicas later on. And the more replicas you've got, the more th read throughput you've got. Only if you've got the hardware to cope with it. Just adding replicas doesn't miraculously make everything go faster. You need to add the, the nodes with it. But there's a whole lot of stuff happening in this cluster. Who controls all this? And the answer to that is the master node. <laughs> a node is a running instance of Elasticsearch. All right, so there we've got node A. A cluster is one or more nodes that have the same cluster name working together. So we add node B, uh, and uh, th those two form a cluster. When you add a new node, it needs to discover the cluster. And it does that uh, with multicast. It just sends out a broadcast saying, hello, is there a cluster here? This is my cluster name. Can I join? Uh, but you can also configure it to use unicast. And so it becomes part of the cluster. You can send a request to any node in the cluster. Uh, and it knows where to forward it to. So we're going to get a document from node A. The document actually lives on a shard on node C, so it forwards it to node C, returns the document to node A, returns it to the client. How does it do this? Well, every node knows where every document in the cluster is, and that information is held in a data structure called the cluster state. It contains just cluster level information. So it, it contains the information about the indices you've got, the shards that they consist of, and what nodes those shards belong to. This cluster state can only be updated by the master node. All right, so he, he, there's a controller, this master node, and he's the only one who can change any of the, this, these bits of information. Uh, the master is elected when the cluster forms. Uh, so when we add a new node, it joins, uh, and a, node A has continued being the master. But it's just a role. Any of these nodes can be master. So when uh, the master fails, the next node would be promoted to master, and the cluster continues working normally. It's important to note that the, the master node only manages the cluster level changes. So none of your document indexing or updating or searching goes through the master. It, 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 can, be, it can use the master like any other node, but it, it, doesn't, it isn't reliant on the master, which means it's not a bottleneck in any system, all right? So it's just the cluster level changes uh, that go through there, not the doc level changes. And the result of all of these uh, moving parts is that you get a distributed real-time search and analytics engine. And it works the same way on your laptop as it does in your 1,000-node cluster. Uh, there are a bunch of people using it, um, or a bunch of people in this room using it, but uh, some of the uh, bigger names are Wikipedia. They're using it for full-text search, highlighted search snippets, uh, search as you type suggestions, or did you mean suggestions for misspellings. The Guardian in the UK combines visitor logs 
with social network data, and it allows them to give instant feedback to their editors about the stories that they've just published. Uh, there will be stories that they're, they're going, well, it's not getting enough press, we need to tweet about this, and they can see the result of that tweet, or the, uh, send two tweets and see the phrasing, uh, how the phrasing of the tweet has affected uh, visitors. Stack Overflow combines full text search with geolocation, and with Stack Overflow, there's always people asking duplicate questions. So it uses the more like this functionality to find related questions and answers. GitHub searches repositories, users, issues, pull requests. Code, code is hard to search, but they're doing that. And they're doing it across 130 billion lines of code. They also use it to log all of their systems. They track all of the alerts, events, and logs that go through all of their servers. So they've got a, 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 um, instant feedback about things that are going wrong in their system. And finally, Goldman Sachs, um, they index and analyze five terabytes of logs per day to keep their systems running. That's all I've got for you. Uh, you can get Elasticsearch here, uh, commercial sports available here and we're hiring. Thank you. Thanks, Clinton. Get your questions ready if you have them. Um, do you, uh, what you described there looked very similar when you had your separate nodes to a typical Mongo replica set where you have this eventual consistency state. Do you also have the limitation where you have to have a, um, an odd number of, of nodes in the cluster to prevent a split brain. And also, uh, if you have that scenario, then you end up with the scenario where I've always had an issue with, uh, with Mongo that two, na two nodes are in fact worse than one. Okay. Um, okay, so Mongo goes for eventual consistency. We prize consistency over availability. Okay, so you are right, in order to have um, uh, a, a kind of a, a cluster that you know to be valid, you need at least three nodes, okay? So that means that if one node goes down, if, if you have two nodes and they split, then each one will become a cluster in its own right. Uh, and r changes that go to one won't go to the other, and the only way to get them to join again is to restart one. If you've got three, and one of them goes down, you can configure it with, it's a setting called minimum master nodes, to say you must be able to see at least two uh, master eligible nodes in order to know that you're part of the cluster. So in that case, if one node gets separated from the other two, the two will carry on running fine. The one will say, okay, I'm not part of the cluster. I'm, I'm just gonna keep pinging it until I can join the cluster again. So yes, you, and, and that's a very important setting. You do, uh, you do need to set that. Um, your, uh, when you said that two nodes is worse than one, kind of depends what you're doing. I mean, what you're talking about there is how do you handle the split brain. Um, for a long time, you don't know which side of the cluster you're on. Sure. Um, it depends upon your use case. So, for instance, if you, if all of your data is actually in MySQL and you're just copying it to Elasticsearch for search purposes, then having two nodes means you've got some redundancy. Uh, you can always rebuild the the, the indices if if they have separated. Um, if you've only got one node and it goes down, well, then then you've got no search. All right. That that said, if it is important that uh, the changes get copied to all of the nodes in the cluster, you've got no way to rebuild that, then really you need to have at least three nodes. Cool. There's a question down the front here. Hi. You said you're using a transaction log to avoid f-syncing your segments, but in order to f for the transaction log itself to be safe, it has to be f-synced. That's only one part of it, though. So, we, we, yes, it does. And that, uh, that f-sync does happen, uh, but... Uh, first of all, it's, it's a smaller file, and secondly, it's not our only redundancy. We're, that, uh, when it's uh, indexed on one node, it's also getting indexed on another node. So it, it's a, um, a, not a single failure mechanism. I actually wondered if I should put that in the slides. I went, no, it's too complicated. <laughs> 
Hi, you mentioned at the beginning of your talk that uh, you have an inverted index and you index each word individually. Yeah. And then you gave an example of percent darling, percent buds, percent, uh, which is a phrase. Yeah. So how do you efficiently reconstruct the phrase? Um, because we index w uh, term positions as well. And, and so there are queries devoted to, you can find uh, words within a certain distance of each other um, or even in a different order but close together. Uh, and the closer together they are, the more relevant they will be considered. Do you see applications for Elasticsearch in bioinformatics? Uh, sure. In fact, uh, my co-author, Zachary Tong, comes from a biology background. I don't know why the, the, the doctor and the biologist is right, uh, we're writing a book about Elasticsearch, but that's how it's worked out. Um, and he's done, uh, uh, what's interesting about him is he's done a lot of statistical work uh, with bio, um, with his bio background, and he's adding those as aggregations in the analytics part of Elasticsearch. Um, we, we did try to do some uh, genome matching, but we didn't come up with a, a better solution than what's really available. Right. Any more questions? One more? Two? Two? Let's see. Any more questions? <laughs> Three here? Hi. So it seems like you're doing a lot of pre processing on data when you're putting yep. it inside the index. Is consumption speed a bit of a bottleneck if you've got a low read frequency but a lot of data flowing in? Uh, uh, how much hardware have you got? Uh, I mean, we've got uh, one customer who's just come on who's, who's doing 500,000 writes a second. Uh, he needs a lot of nodes to do that. But yeah, it, um, it, it's, obvious, it's never going to be as, as fast writing as just a, a dumb process which leaves the processing for query time. Hi. Uh, hello. Hi. Um, you speak a lot about doing things in RAM. Yeah. Not a problem if your uh, data is on the order of terabytes? Um, well, no, because it's a problem that can be distributed. And it's not the only answer as well. So. Um, Another possibility, there's something called doc values, which essentially takes the field data at index time and writes that to disk in that format. Um, and then you're hitting disk rather than RAM to search those things. It comes at a cost of speed. But yes, it allows you to scale out to uh, much heavier uh, amounts of RAM usage. Typically, you... You, you, you're not loading all of your data into RAM. You're, you're only aggregating on a few fields or sorting on a few fields. And, and so, yes, you need to keep an eye on how much RAM you're using, uh, but it, um, it's not an insurmountable problem. And it's always one that can be solved by adding more nodes. Okay, last question. <laughs> uh, uh, how do you deal with uh, <coughs> different languages? Uh, we've... So... Part of the process we didn't talk about is when you broke up those words into terms and to stick them in an inverted index. And uh, that's called the analysis process. And there are a whole bunch of anal analyzers that are um, built specifically for different languages to, to improve the searchability of each language. For instance, Japanese, you can have three different scripts within the same sentence. And so there's a, a, a Japanese analyzer which knows how to deal with these three scripts. Uh, language is a, di a difficult thing to solve, but um, a full-text search engine is, is the, the way to do it. Does it mean that you must have more Yes. So you can, you can treat all text in the same way, but you, you can get further by knowing what language it is. Great. Cool. Thanks, Clinton. Let's give him a round Thank of applause. You.